So we're going to talk about shoulder problems. We're going to start out with a bang. Sometimes it's a big black box compared to other joints in the uh, body. Um, we, Dr. Feely and I are doing a little bit of a tag team approach. Um, so if there's some gaps in my slides, that's because he's filling them in in the subsequent talk. So don't get frustrated that I'm like leaving out huge things and throw things at me as I'm leaving the podium, all right? You can throw them at Dr. Feely. <laughs> he can move faster. Um, okay, let's see. Trying to advance these. Okay, disclosures. Um, I have received a grant from OREF in the past. It's really the only one disclosure I have other than that I'm a big Duke fan. So, and they're playing tomorrow and I'm gonna miss the game in Vegas. I was gonna go, but teaching you guys, so. All right, so starting out with the basics, just a little bit briefly, um, because you need to get your landmarks and your map um, so that you know what I'm talking about in these subsequent uh, types of injuries. Um, let me get my pointer out here. Clavicle in the front of your shoulder, AC joint is on the top, very important. Big problem, uh, child, oftentimes causes pain. Um, the coracoid process is in the front, it's a little knob if you push in deep on your chest, a lot of uh, tendons attached there. The chromion is the bone that covers over the top of the shoulder, it's kind of square shaped. Um, and the greater tuberosity deep under the skin, under the deltoid, here's where uh, the, a lot of the rotator cuff tendons attach. So those are good landmarks in terms of physical exam, which Dr. Feely's gonna get into later. Um, deltoid, just some basic anatomy, uh, has three origins um, which impacts on its ability to do different tasks. Um, the front part attaches to your clavicle in the front, the middle part attaches to your chromion on the side, and then the posterior part attaches to the scapular sc spine. So depending on which part is activated, you can do different things with your deltoid. You can abduct your shoulder, you can pull your shoulder forward or your arm forward, or you can pull it back. Okay, rotator cuff, the thing that we always think about with the shoulder specifically, um, has four parts that we learned in medical school. Um, the different components do different functions, just like in the deltoid. Um, Dr. Feely's gonna get into this a lot more in terms of uh, physical exam and the different functions, but it allows ab abduction, external rotation, and internal rotation of the shoulder. Long head of the biceps. Um, a long, kind of thin structure that goes up, um, attaches to your muscle um, of the biceps and goes up the front of the shoulder and into the shoulder joint proper. It's also a problem child and can cause a lot of issues with pain and anterior, especially anterior shoulder pain in patients. We're going to get into that in a second. <clears throat> um, there is also a short head of the biceps that attaches to the coracoid, but the long head of the biceps is particularly prone to tendonitis um, due to overuse type injuries. AC joint, we commonly refer to as the shoulder separation joint. It's on the top of the shoulder. Uh, it has two ligaments that connect the clavicle to the acromion. Um, also two ligaments that connect the clavicle to the coracoid. Um, and then the glenohumeral joint, the true shoulder joint. Um, sometimes people confuse shoulder separations and shoulder dislocations, so it's important to keep them um, separated and, and that you know your terminology. Um, it relies a lot on the rotator cuff and also ligaments um, for stability. Um, the, a lot of the stability comes from the shape of the humeral head, which is kind of round, and also the glenoid, which is the socket. It's a little bit uh, shallow, so we lot rely a lot on, as I said, muscles and, tend and ligaments for stability in the shoulder, which is where we get into shoulder dislocations. Okay. The glenoid labrum deepens the, uh, the glenoid. Um, those are the ligaments, and they provide stability to the shoulder joint. Okay, so that, now that we've gone through that briefly, and you can keep this for your reference, we're gonna get into specific problems, which is the real meat of the talk. Um, if you notice, I circled the top four um, items on this, this differential diagnosis. Those are the most common types of problems that patients may present to you with in the clinic. Um, but there's a lot of red herrings, um, I call them zebras, um, on the bottom that you have to think of, and sometimes it's important that we have Dr. O'Neill talking to you later because cervical spine issues can present as shoulder pain, quite frequently, actually. Patients think it's a shoulder pain issue, and it's actually referred from a cervical spine issue. So, um, 
On the right, I've, I've listed kind of brief bullet points of the things that, that patients will complain of with these more common problems, especially rotator cuff, shoulder OA, and a frozen shoulder. If you notice, rotator cuff patient has pain at night, not necessarily all day long, pain with overhead activities, and weakness. Um, shoulder OA, they have pain all the time, um, loss of motion, slow onset, um, maybe over years, and they have uh, grinding. Um, oftentimes when you're just passively mo moving them back and forth, you may feel <laughs> So it's important when you're examining and talking to patients. Frozen shoulder sometimes can be confused with a shoulder arthritis, but it's usually slow, um, quicker in onset, usually due to some sort of overactivity, um, causes loss of motion also, pretty substantial loss of motion. So those are just th bullet points you can file away in the back of your head, easy to memorize, that will help you get to the top three types of uh, problems that patients have. Okay. All right, so again, history is 90% of the diagnosis, and I slipped by this slide. Um, was there an acute injury? Are you losing strength? And are you losing range of motion? Those will help you get to 90% of the diagnosis without even laying hands on the patient. Then you lay hands on the patient and you figure out the rest of the way without an MRI, amazingly. All right, Dr. Feely's gonna talk about specific physical exams. So I'm gonna skip over that because that would make my talk about three times as long. So we'll, we'll uh, let him get to that. But I'll give you a couple little bullet points as we get to different problems. All right, so I'm gonna do this case by case so you guys can try to think of what the problem is based on those questions that we talked about and those bullet points of the key points of the top three problems. 54-year-old woman presents with four months of shoulder pain that occurred just after taking her jacket off. She now has trouble getting things off high shelves, can't put her belt on. Okay, so remember on the right side we have these kind of bullet points that I'm gonna drill into your heads by the end of this talk. Was there an acute injury? No, right? She's taking her jacket off. Is she losing strength? Not really. Is she losing range of motion? Oh my, oh my, yes. So, all right, so remember those three things on the side. Which one, we'll just do, we can, you guys can just shout out the answer. We won't use the AVS. Is she rotator cuff tear, shoulder OA, or frozen shoulder? What do you think? Nothing. Okay, I need to work, I need to work on my talk here. Okay, so she's doesn't have, she has pain at night. She doesn't really complain about weakness. She doesn't have grinding. She does have loss of motion and she has pain, but it was fa uh, fast in onset, just a few months. So most likely diagnosis is the fro frozen shoulder in this case. So Dr. Philly's gonna get into physical exam, but these patients often have very restricted range of motion. The big differentiator versus shoulder OA is they don't have the grinding when you put your hand on their shoulder and move them through range of motion. But they're very restricted. Feels like you're trying to move a cement block, when you, especially when you try to externally rotate the patient. Oftentimes they can't even reach their buttock. A lot of women come in complaining they can't take their bra off. So. Um, key points, no real trauma, pain all the time, relatively fast onset, shoulder OA takes years, um, and limited active and passive range of motion. The patient left arm is the one that's frozen, can't externally rotate, can't, can't forward elevate the arm. So it's the second most common problem um, or cause of pain uh, for shoulder pain in the U.S. In, in the patients 40 to 60, and we don't really know why people get it. We know that patients that are diabetic and have thyroid problems tend to be prone to having this issue. Um, I also seem to see sometimes people with autoimmune, other autoimmune disorders like uh, hepatitis I've seen. Um, so it's, there's, but we really don't know the cause. Unfortunately, natural history of these is kind of painful for both you and the patient because it takes a long time to resolve. Um, at first it's pretty, it's, uh, Painful, the patient gets stiff, then they get stuck in stiffness, then the pain gradually de decreases as their motion improves. And if you notice this timeline, which is kind of small, sometimes it can take several years, a couple of years. Um, so you have to tell your patient they've got to be painful, uh, excuse me, they are, they are painful, they have to be patient um, with the time course, because um, there's no quick fix. 
If we did pathology slides of this in terms of frozen shoulders, thickening of the capsule and a lot of inflammatory cells and fibrosis, which is why we put patients on anti-inflammatories. Sometimes we even think about doing a cortisone shot into the glenohumeral joint to try to help the unfreezing process. But mainly, um, it's physical therapy, working on motion, trying to control discomfort, um, doing a, possibly doing a glenohumeral and joint injection, but telling patient they need to be patient, and, um, but it may take over a year to resolve. We generally only do surgery for this when all the other modalities fail and the people aren't responding to any of the conservative courses, but that will be after a year at least. Um, so generally it's time and patience and physical therapy and injections. All right, second case, a uh, 43-year-old male with six months of shoulder pain. It hurts at night, not all the time. He has pain with overhead activity, but he doesn't feel like he's weak. And there's no history of trauma, but he does like to lift at the uh, gym. Okay, so he's, well, let's see, go back. He is only 43. Um, was there an acute injury? No. Is he losing strength? No. And he's not really losing motion. So this one isn't on this list of the common ones, although it is kind of common. This is kind of your classic shoulder impingement or what we call bursitis of the shoulder, oftentimes due to overuse type of activities or maybe just some generalized poor mechanics in the shoulder, um, not due to a cuff tear. Um, insidious onset of pain, pain generally with overhead activities. Oftentimes patients have pain with reaching behind their back. They may have a small amount of stiffness, but not frozen shoulder or arthritis type of stiffness. And they oftentimes complain that they have pain lying on their side, sleeping at night on that side, especially with their arm over their head. Um, they have difficulty doing overhead types of activities, no weakness on their rotator cuff exam, and they have positive impingement signs, which Dr. Feely will show you those tests. Um, oftentimes it's due to bursitis that's gotten thickened and inflamed right over the rotator cuff in this area and underneath the acromion and the acromial clavicular, um, the acromial clavicular ligament. Um, the, basically, the, the bursa gets compressed. And if you think about it, if someone has bad mechanics or maybe weak uh, scapular stabilizers, it'll allow the humeral head to ride up more and impinge that bursa and cause inflammation. And then the, the uh, rotator cuff gets inflamed and sometimes even the biceps gets irritated too. We don't usually get an MRI when we suspect um, impingement. Um, if the, as long as that patient has good rotator cuff strength, there's no reason to really get an MRI. Um, we only order an MRI when someone's weak. Um, so you have, a good physical exam is super important. <clears throat> so first, tr first line of treatment for impingement is strengthening of the rotator cuff muscles and the scapular stabilizers, because if you have poor posture, poor mechanics, that's gonna cause an issue. You want to try to con control inflammation. Generally, you start with ice and anti-inflammatories. Uh, we can do a cortisone shot. We usually reserve that um, when people fail the first line of physical therapy, steroid injection, excuse me, physical therapy and anti-inflammatories. I generally will order an MRI before I put a cortisone shot into a patient um, because I want to make sure I'm not missing a small cuff tear that's not showing up on physical exam. Um, and then if patients fail all those modalities, sometimes we'll think about doing something called a subacromial decompression where we take out that inflamed bursa um, and maybe even resect a little bit if the patient has a very large undersurface acromial spur. Um, but generally, if they have good therapy and they do all these um, modalities, people do improve and you don't need to do the surgical treatment. There's a big algorithm that you can save if you're trying to figure out what to do and when to refer. Um, basically, again, it's physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, thinking about a cortisone shot, and then if they don't improve, get an MRI um, just to make sure, and then surgery if the patients don't improve with good quality physical therapy. All right, case three, 56-year-old male, bad sign that they're doing crazy things in the gym like this. Um, three months of shoulder pain and weakness after an awkward fall doing CrossFit. CrossFit. Mm -hmm. Keeps me in business. <laughs> that and skiing and soccer. <clears throat> um, hasn't been able to return to the gym, which is horrid. Um, he has a pain at night and lifting things is difficult. So we go back to our little algorithm, asking questions and cross-referencing against our cheat sheet. Was there an acute injury? 
Yes. Okay. Is he losing strength? Yes. Are you late losing range of motion? Is he losing range of motion? No, not really. Okay, so he has pain at night, pain with overhead activity and weakness. That looks possible. He doesn't have restrictions in motion. There's no grinding when we rotate his shoulder. And he doesn't have restrictions in motion that would suggest a frozen shoulder. So we're thinking rotator cuff tear because there's an acute injury. So now I'm cutting you off right here because Dr. Fe I don't want to, talk to steal Dr. Feely's thunder. He'll come after me. So he's going to talk all about this in a, in a good physical exam for rotator cuff in his next talk. So, All right, 76-year-old male with four years of worsening pain uh, and weakness with golf. He has some pain at night, and he describes pain in, in, as a toothache in his shoulder. He notes that he has lost some range of motion. Okay, was there an acute injury? No. And it's slow in onset. Are you losing strength? No. Is he losing motion? Yes. So which one do you think it is on the right-hand side? Just by exclusion, you guys are smart. You all went to medical school and, and uh, college and athletic training. <laughs> We've already gone through the first two, right? I mean, first one and three. So by exclusion, it's shoulder OA. And he has some grinding. Okay, so this is where x-rays are helpful in the office. You're like, whoa. Okay, a med, a med student can see that that's shoulder OA. There's no joint space. Uh, big spur at the bottom, bone on bone. Um, even the right one's pretty bad. So, um, But that's why people get grinding because the bones are grinding against each other and there's no cartilage. Oops, sorry. Yikes. All right, so loss of motion treatment. Um, helpful to get x-rays um, as a first line because if there's arthritis, then we know we're going down the, um, the uh, glenohumeral arthritis pathway. If, if there's no arthritis, then we're probably dealing with a frozen shoulder. But again, the time course is oftentimes quite different and the age group oftentimes is much different. Generally older patients, slower time course, we're thinking arthritis, and the x-rays are very helpful. A lot of times it's helpful to have someone hold a weight when they do the x-rays, because then that closes down that joint space and you can see the arthritis better. But sometimes it's very obvious, like those two x-rays that I showed you. Okay. So generally we try, start with non-operative treatment for shoulder arthritis. Um, Anti-inflammatories are helpful for pain control, but don't really work the same way as a frozen shoulder, which is due to inflammation. Um, Physical therapy is helpful in mild to moderate um, arthritis in terms of trying to restore some motion and some strength to help that patient get through things. Um, there is some data that shows that, that glenohumeral joint injections are also helpful. But generally, if patients fail those and they're still having a lot of discomfort um, and they still have very restricted range of motion, a good option that provides good results is, um, shoulder, um, is a shoulder replacement. Um, there are some different types of treatment modalities. If someone doesn't have an intact rotator cuff, you may have heard of a reverse shoulder replacement. We're not really going to get into this in this setting. Um, it may be one of the talks later. But um, a shoulder replacement can provide very good pain control and good motion. Um, there are complications with any surgery, as, as we know, um, but it does give uh, patients good results. All right. Now we're getting a younger patient. 37-year-old computer engineer has four months of anterior shoulder pain. Think anterior, you start thinking about what I was talking about at the very beginning of the talk. Uh, he cannot complete his workouts. He is markedly tender along his, the front of his shoulder. Um, he has an MRI arthrogram that shows a superior labral tear. Okay, key points of the history. Um, was there an acute injury? Really didn't describe one. More overuse. Um, is he losing strength? No. Is he losing range of motion? No. Okay, so this is one of those more in that impingement category where you got to talk to the patient and examine them to figure out what's going on. It doesn't really qualify to the top three. Oops. So anterior, there's a lot of things in the front of the shoulder, un unfortunately or fortunately. Um, you have your long head of your biceps in the, in the uh, bicipital groove. You also have the subscapularis tendon, which attaches in the front, but your physical exam should help sort out whether the patient has weakness in the subscap. Um, he also didn't really have a trauma, and he's younger, so the likelihood of having a cuff tear in a younger patient without trauma is, is lower. Um, it could be a superior labral tear. That oftentimes causes pain on the joint line in the front. 
but a lot of times it's more in the back. Um, or it could be AC joint arthritis, but that's on the top of the shoulder. So good physical exam should sort out pain up here versus pain here. The more likely pro process is this guy's doing, oops, sheepers, sorry, backing up. More likely process is, since this guy's been lifting weights, that it's biceps irritation. Um, there's a lot of difficulty with the overlap between the superior labral tears and biceps. Um, and a lot of patients will come in with an MRI, especially people over 40, uh, with a labral tear or a slap tear, especially when they get an arthrogram. Um, so it's very difficult sometimes to sort out, and patients freak out that they have a labral tear, and then they come in to see us, and a lot of times it's just natural process when we get above 40 that we can have some labral fraying or some labral tearing, and that's not even what the issue is. It may just be biceps pain or biceps tendonitis. Generally, operative superior labral tears um, are used due, due to an acute injury, throwing injury, younger patient, usually un under 30, um, and they have pain with an O'Brien's test, which Dr. Feely is going to talk about. And they really don't have any pain in the biceps groove because the labral tear is further over towards the midline at, in the front of the shoulder joint. Biceps pain, or biceps tendonitis, is due to overuse type of activity. It also has pain with that O'Brien's test, but the pain localizes more to the biceps groove, which you can actually run your finger over your shoulder in the front, and you'll feel the biceps. It feels like this like cord-like structure going north-south in the groove, which that's why you should go to the shoulder physical exam classes because then you'll learn how to push on all these things. Um, slap lesions, again, younger patient, oftentimes to fall on an outstretched hand or some sort of trauma. We'll operate on them if the patient's uh, younger and fix it, if, it, if it's conservative management fails, but if they're older, um, oftentimes we try non-operative treatment we don't usually repair that superior labral tear. Sometimes what we'll do is disconnect the biceps and reattach that to the shoulder to get rid of that traction of the biceps onto the labrum and get rid of their symptoms because they tend to get more problems with stiffness if we do a labral repair. So there's this another algorithm that you can save for your notes if you're trying to figure out what to do with a patient. But just remember that slap tears in older patients, especially over 30, more, more like 40, um, tend to be non-operative treatment. Um, and don't freak out if you see that on one of your patient's MRIs because it's oftentimes an incidental finding. Um, biceps tendonitis is more based on physical exam and we can treat them oftentimes with physical therapy and rest and sometimes an injection. So. We'll skip over this, okay. All right, case five. 25, we're getting younger as we go here. 25-year-old <laughs> rugby player is attempting to make a tackle. His arm's forced into abducted, externally rotated uh, position. He falls to the ground in pain and is unable to continue. Um, his exam on the sidelines reveals, obviously, significant shoulder pain, more like screaming, um, and an inability to actively or passively internally rotate the arm. He's kind of locked like this, can't bring it across, can't bring it out again this way. Okay, so we got our cheat sheet on the most common top three, but we're getting younger and these things are less common in that age group. Was there an acute injury? Yes, I was playing rugby. Are you, is he losing strength? Yes, because his arm's painful and he doesn't even want to move it. In fact, he's kind of stuck in one position. And is he losing range of motion? Yes, his shoulder's stuck in one position. So this is one of the not top three. Um, and usually these patients will go to the ER, hopefully, before they come to you in the office. <laughs> um, shoulder dislocation with the shoulder out. And you can see the deformity of this side versus this side because the humeral head is sitting in front of the glenoid on this patient in the emergency room. 90% um, of the uh, dislocations of the glenohumeral joint are out the front. Um, it's very rare to have them out the back and it's actually quite easy for the emergency room to miss. Um, that's why we're pretty, we always want to have two perpendicular views of the humeral head to make sure the shoulder's in the joint because this is, this is actually a posterior humeral dislocation. Um, and you can't really tell that it's out of the joint. It's, this is very obvious, the anterior dislocation. There's a lot of overlap with the humeral head and the glenoid, but this isn't so obvious. Um, so it's very easy to miss in the emergency room if they just do one x-ray. Um, in terms of treatment, the most, usually we, the ER reduces the patient and then we try non-operative treatment as first line. We don't generally operate on people 
when they have a first time dislocation, um, unless there's some extenuating circumstance, like they have an older patient maybe have a rotator cuff tear associated with a dislocation, which you have to watch out for with patients over 40. Younger patients, sometimes they can pull a big piece of bone off and we have to fix that in the early setting. But generally, we don't do surgery on first time dislocators. We do immobilization for a short time and then physical therapy. And again, the exceptions for surgery are these that we just, I just talked about. Um, if they have recurrent dislocations, we may think about doing surgical repair if they fail non-operative treatment um, in any of these age groups. Again, in your older patient that has a dislocation of the shoulder, think of them in a different category. If they come in, they were in the emergency room, they somehow dislocated their shoulder in a fall, get an MRI. Uh, we don't always get an MRI on the younger patients the first time they dislocate, but in older patients, the likelihood they tore their rotator cuff is quite high, and, you, and they will do well if we fix that rotator cuff tear acutely. Um, in the pathology of a rotator cuff, or excuse me, a labral tear, is that the, um, this labrum that surrounds the glonide and deepens it is torn in the front down at the bottom. And with that and stretching out of the capsule from the dislocation, the patient is more possibly more prone to repeat dislocation. So when we do the surgical treatment, we fix this labral tear right here, and then we also tighten up the capsule. All right, <clears throat> 24-year-old football player gets tackled and his right shoulder is driven into the ground when he lands on, the slide, on his side. Um, he has immediate pain over the top of his shoulder and a palpable, de palpable deformity on the top of his shoulder. So, key points in the history, was there an acute injury? Yes. Are you losing strength? Yeah, because it's painful and really hurts to like raise my arm up in space. Do you have range of motion loss? Yeah, because it's painful to do active range of motion. Passive range of motion, not so bad. So we already went through these, so you know I'm not gonna re reiterate or go over these again. Um, so what is this? Now we're thinking, top of the shoulder, there's only really one thing there. There's two things actually, the clavicle, AC joint, and the, um, and the acromion. But this is the old shoulder separation, um, commonly due to a fall on the lateral aspect of the shoulder. Um, it's an injury to the acromioclavicular and CC, um, lig coracol ah, talk about coracoclavicular ligaments. And sometimes when it's a significant AC joint injury, there may be a prominence over the AC joint like in this patient that's right here. Boom. Um, there are different grades of AC sprains, and this, the, the lowest grade just causes pain, and there you can't even see a deformity. Um, X-rays obviously are going to be very helpful with seeing what's going on here and differentiate it from possibly a fracture at the end of the clavicle, which could present pretty similarly in terms of what it looks like on the patient, um, and the mechanism can be pretty similar also. Patient has tenderness. They have weakness due to muscle, muscle shutdown and pain. Um, Again, there's a prominence there that you can see. I had a patient that uh, fell off his bike and came in um, two days ago that had a type 5 AC separation where the clavicle's just sitting up in the breeze right under the skin and buttonholes through all the muscles that are um, above it. By and large, though, most of them heal without surgical intervention. We just rest with a sling, send to physical therapy. But however, there are a few, the higher grade uh, type AC separations like the one on the bottom that would, be benefic would benefit from surgical reconstruction. So by and large, if you see a patient and it looks like the, the collarbone's sitting up in the breeze, you may want to refer them to a surgeon. So. All right, now, one common one that you're gonna see that's atraumatic oftentimes in your office um, is AC joint arthritis. And they sent you out a survey a few weeks ago about things you wanted to learn to, so I added this slide on. I wasn't really thinking about it. Um, patients have pain uh, with palpation over that AC joint on the top of the shoulder. Um, they have an achiness in the shoulder. Uh, one of my friends calls it the great masquerader because it's kind of this just general achiness on the top and it's really hard to pinpoint what the problem is. Patients oftentimes have pain with reaching across their body because it compresses that joint. Um, and they oftentimes have great relief um, for several months with an injection, a cortisone injection into that joint. Um, this is a, a full-blown arthritis of the acromioclavicular joint. And the, basically the bones grind together and it's pretty painful and causes night pain. 
patient doesn't have any weakness or restrictions of motion on physical exam. So think about this, especially when you see a, kind of a bump over the AC joint and patients have complaint of pain primarily on the top. Um, sometimes patients can get a year of relief just with intermittent injections. Uh, and sometimes patients can get some relief just with removing a little sliver of bone from the end of the clavicle to get rid of a little bit of that arthritis. All right, so then last but not least, think about the rare but not so rare shoulder zebras. Again, cervical spine can be a problem. Um, it can present as shoulder pain. Sometimes it's more shoulder pain like down next to the medial border of the scapula. Um, the patients oftentimes have radiating pain down, the, down to the hand, so think about that. That's where Dr. O'Neill comes in in terms of saving the day. Parson, something called Parsonage Turner. Um, calcific tendonitis, less common, fibromyalgia, and rare tumors. Um, calcific, Parsonage Turner is a uh, sudden onset uh, so, oh, wait, actually, I'm going to get into that. I forgot that I do have a slide on that if I added it. Uh, calcific tendonitis, um, acute onset of severe atraumatic shoulder pain may make a reasonable person go to the emergency room and be very demanding. And if the emergency room the physician thinks the patient's malingering, um, <laughs> it's quite interesting. Um, I've, and we, we all get these emergency emails from colleagues that also, all of a sudden have severe onset of shoulder pain and they didn't, nothing really happened. Um, they act like they have a fracture, basically. Um, and it's an acute inflammatory process due to breakdown of calcium deposits in the bursa or the rotator cuff. This little thing that kind of looks like a tic-tac here, a um, little bit of it breaks off and it causes a huge amount of inflammation in the subacromial space and the bursa gets inflamed and patients have pretty horrific pain, actually. And it can be just due to doing some task around the house. It can oftentimes lead to frozen shoulder because the patient doesn't want to move that arm and then there's an inflammation process going on. It's a bad customer. Um, and one of the things that's helpful is doing an x-ray. It oftentimes will show up. Um, the treatment is anti-inflammatories and physical therapy. Patients get a tremendous amount of relief with a cortisone shot with this early. Like they think you're a savior. Um, so it's in, there's something called a barbitage where you can actually, treat, if you're really good, use ultrasound or maybe even just kind of localize on the x-rays where that calcium deposit is and you take a needle and you break it up a little bit and then you inject them with, I know you guys are all looking at me like, are you crazy? But it does work. Um, and you basically break it up a little bit and inject the cortisone in and it's very helpful for patients in terms of treatment. Uh, sometimes they have a huge amount of this in the subacromal space and we have to um, clean it out arthroscopically and it looks like toothpaste. Sometimes it's actually in the rotator cuff and we have to fix the cuff because we're taking it out. Um, but it's the, the weirdest thing actually. It, and when it comes out it just kind of goes like, like you're squeezing a, a thing of toothpaste. Um, but it can cause a lot of stiffness um, and a lot of issues for patients. Parsonage Turner. Um, can act also like severe pain initially um, or act like a severe rotator cuff tear with no history of acute injury. Um, patient starts out with horrific pain and radicular pain symptoms, oftentimes going down the arm, pain shooting into the fingers for a couple weeks. Um, and then the significant weakness follows, even with muscle, uh, marked muscle atrophy. And it's due to um, an axonal injury of the nerve um, and we don't really know what causes it. I've seen patients get it after childbirth. Um, sometimes patients get it after a viral illness. There's a lot of kind of strange etiologies. But um, think about this when patients, especially post-childbirth, horrific pain that goes away after a couple weeks and all of a sudden the patient's really, really weak. And then you may even see some significant atrophy. I've had quite a few patients, remember Dr. Center and I talking about her first patient that came in with, with this and she was like baffled and I'm like, oh, that sounds like Parsonage Turner and that's what it was. Oftentimes it can show up on an MRI um, and an EMG. The treatment is anti-inflammatory, is pain medicine for those first two weeks just to get them through that um, consistent physical therapy and patients, patients, patients. I have had patients not turn the corner on this and re get that nerve supply back to the muscle for like a year and a half, two years. It's quite marked, and then all of a sudden the muscle kind of bounces back. So, all right, so last but not least, um, common shoulder problems. Think about cuff, rotator cuff, frozen shoulder, biceps, and arthritis. Use a rationally guided approach 
to your shoulder phys history and exam. Dr. Feely's gonna follow up on an excellent physical exam. And your treatment should be based on the patient's goals and their level of incapacity. And when all else fails and you've ruled out all the simple things, think about the zebras, okay? Thanks.